So last time, well, last time, this time, every time, we're just gonna be talking about this the whole time. And so uh, we wanna start thinking about AX equal to B. And what I wanna start us now starting to consider is uh, the fact that last time when we talked, or even a lot of times when you've had a linear algebra course, normally the matrix A, you know, it's a, it can be complex numbers, who cares, but usually it's an n by n matrix, square. So it's like n equations, n unknowns, and one of the things that we learned how to do is solve this, let's say, by Gaussian elimination. And part of what we want to do is figure out alternatives to Gaussian elimination because that's in a very expensive way to solve AX equal to B every single time, especially for large scale matrices. The thing I want to talk about though now is the fact that we're going to start breaking this here. Let's start thinking about M by Ns, where M does not equal N. So now we're gonna have two different scenarios to play out for ourselves. In one case, let's, let's do the two cases. I'm gonna have an underdetermined system of equations. And what this means, M is less than N. So M is the number of rows. Often we can think of these as the number of constraints that we have. And N is the number of, basically number of columns can be the number of unknowns that we have. So here we have less constraints than unknowns. So one way to draw this matrix, it looks something like this. So it is rectangular. And oftentimes, especially as we do think about data science, oftentimes these are really short, really fat matrices. Okay? The vector X is here, which is N is equal to B. Here is your AX equal to B. How are we gonna do now? This is very interesting, right? Because if you look at this, AX equal to B that we have here, it's underdetermined. It's un underdetermined because there's not enough constraints to to nail down these, these all these values. So in this case, when we think about solving AX equal to B, we in some sense have an ill-conditioned problem because what you're actually going to get is you have an infinite number of potential solutions. Okay. And then normally we'd say, well, how do you handle that in Gaussian elimination? Gaussian elimination was built for n by n's. And so you have n equations, n unknowns, and the whole idea, all you had to avoid was a determinant A being zero and you had a solution. And now I'm already telling you that these matrices are canonical. We see them everywhere in data science or even in having data. And a lot of numerical linear algebra has moved to this frontier of, you know, that's your data, that matrix. And you want to find things about that data by analyzing the structure of that matrix. So that's an underdetermined system. We can also think about overdetermined systems. So in this case, what you're looking at, and let me quit my mail so it doesn't beep at us while we're going along. Okay. So overdetermined systems. Instead, there's M is bigger than N. In other words, there's more rows than columns, which means there's more constraints than there are unknowns. Okay, so in this case, matrices look like this. There's your AX equal to B. And oftentimes, so this is a, a tall skinny matrix. This is a short fat matrix. And oftentimes these are very big matrices. And notice what's happening here. 
look at all the constraints I have to, sat I have to satisfy and I don't have that many variables to satisfy it in. So it's overdetermined. In fact, generically, there is no solution to it. Okay. So why do I emphasize over and under determined system? One which has an infinite number, one which has no solutions, because you know, the fact of the matter is if I go to MATLAB or Python and just say something like, I put either of those matrices in and hit the backslash, what do you get? A solution. So have you thought about what's coming out of that thing? Because I just told you there's either no solution or an infinite number of solutions, okay? And so part of what we wanna address in linear algebra in general, especially nowadays, is the fact that this is probably more the situation you're gonna be dealing with, is really big matrices that are short, uh, tall and skinny, or short and fat. And yet I've told you they are ill-posed because I either have infinity solutions. So how do I pick one of them? And this one here on the overdetermined, I actually don't have a solution. I can't satisfy everything. So what do we do at that point? Okay, so let's talk about solving over and under determined systems because also this is gonna get us very close to making at least some connection with deep neural nets. And I wanna talk a little bit about framing these and then framing in some sense more broadly optimization and what we call regularizers. So let's start with this idea of regularization, okay? Regularization is basically a way of saying, you didn't give me enough information to solve this. A regularization is basically imposing some kind of constraint or some extra feature into my solution that allows me to uniquely determine a solution. Okay, that's all a regularizer is. And regularizers are really important, uh, not only in linear algebra, but they're really just basically the heart of doing deep neural nets as well, which is in some sense a form of nonlinear linear algebra. Okay, or nonlinear algebra. All right, so let's start. I'm gonna erase these. I hope you have that in your mind, how to think about over and under determined systems, two ill-posed problems that we commonly face. And the amazing thing is when I took my linear algebra undergraduate course, we did not even dare talk about that problem somehow over and under determined systems. And I don't know what your linear algebra background was like, but usually the whole course is all about n by n's. And so now we want to talk about how do you actually set this up? Professor, real yes. quick, um, with an overdetermined system, uh, could you have a solution if like a sufficient number of your rows are linearly dependent? Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, it, it, if you say that a bunch of the rows are identical, in other words, oh, yeah. then, okay, yeah. So it's really not a bunch of different constraints. The generic assumption here is that these are all unique constraints. Great, gotcha, thanks. Okay, let's talk about underdetermined systems. So, first of all, I have an infinite number of ways to satisfy it, right? I mean, it's easy to solve AX equal to B, it's just that I can give you an infinite number of solutions X to do this. So oftentimes what's done is instead, is you formulate this as an optimization problem to give you a unique problem. Like what solution do you want? So what you could do instead is formulate this as a minimum as an optimization problem. And let me write one down for you. Here it is. Min Let's talk about what I just wrote down. Here's my minimization problem. Minimize the L2 norm of X subject to X equal to B. So now what I've told you is, oh, so this is an undetermined problem with an infinite number of solutions. And by me formulating it this way, what you've actually done is say, okay, satisfy it. And here is my regularizer as it were. It's saying, 
find me of all the infinite number of solutions, find the solution that has the smallest L2 norm. Okay? You could do any, actually, you could do other things here. We're going to talk about norms in a minute, but oftentimes this is exactly what happens in something like. MATLAB and Python as a default is if you have these large underdetermined systems and you, you just go solve it, it gives you a solution. What solution does it give you? Typically, it gives you a solution where it says, well, of all the infinities of solutions, I'll give you the one with the smallest L2 norm. Okay, so you see how this frames an optimization problem. This is an extra constraint or regularization necessary to take from the infinity to V1 solution that I would get, you would get, everybody could get this uniquely if we all specify this one regularization. Okay, so this is how you might handle an underdetermined system. But if you don't do this, it's just ill posed mathematically. And of course, something like a backslash has this built in. It already assumes, well, clearly you, what you probably mean is you have to regularize, and I'll just assume you're regularizing with an L2 norm. Okay? All right, let's talk about overdetermined systems. Now, in the overdetermined system, it's a little different. In the overdetermined system, because you have so many constraints and not enough unknowns, you actually cannot satisfy AX equal to B. Okay, so what you're going to do instead is do the following. Make AX minus B as small as possible. Okay, and typically the way you would do this, so you could, you could impose this, but oftentimes what people will do is also say, well, and also I want to impose some regularization. So try to satisfy this as best as possible. Plus for instance, maybe I'll add an L2 penalty to it as well. So the loss function now says minimize AX minus B, make it as small as possible, but also try to make the norm as small as possible. And the lambda here is also called a hyperparameter. And the hyperparameter, you can tune it to be big or small, which will tune the relative balance between these two terms against each other. Now, by doing this and picking a lambda, the minimization of this problem gives you a unique solution. So, um, Professor, real yeah. quick, how do you balance the lambda? Oh, that's a great question. Because in fact, there's a lot of solvers, AX equal to B solvers, where in fact, this is uh, one of the magic tricks that you've got to do here. So we just had a question about sparsity. And when you want to go after sparse solutions, let's say, you might also add, call that lambda one, lambda two, an L1 norm. We're going to talk about the one norm in just a moment. But this promotes sparse solutions. And then how do you pick lambda 1, lambda 2? This is usually what's called hyperparameter tuning. So you can adjust these parameters to kind of get the features that you want in sort of your solution. There's no magic number for this. It's a little bit up to the user to define it. And that's, uh, that's, that partly makes people feel uncomfortable. But it's also, remember, you can't satisfy it. This is just simply a set of solutions that you can impose that are minimizing some joint structure there between the solution and something imposed on the solution itself, which is small L2 ball, small L1 ball. Did they just play it by ear? A little bit. We'll talk more about it as we go through the course. But uh, these tuning of these parameters, this is, this is done routinely, especially when you do neural network training, is you impose some functions like this. And then you say, okay, how can I make this work? I got to tune these to get some performance metrics that I like. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Okay, so in other Sorry. words, I have a yeah. quick question. 
Um, how do you, so, so I'm assuming that AX minus B, the magnitude of it would be a matrix norm. How do you be, how do you adding a matrix norm to a vector norm? Oh, this is a, this is the two norm. This is just a number, right? AX is a vector minus that vector. What's the length of vector? Oh, sorry. So this yeah. Is a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these are just some number. They're just measures of lengths of vectors. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I, part of the story here is that AX equal to B is a little more complicated than we think. And when we're thinking about these numerical linear algebra tools that we're going to build out, it's really critical that you think that I'm not just solving n by n square matrices. The world today is dominated by matrices that are tall, skinny, short, fat. Massively, massively overdetermined or massively, massively underdetermined. And you're still going to try to come up with good numerical algorithms to give you solutions out of those problems. And this is some way that you start thinking about how would I formulate that for the for, for whatever I need to do in my problem specifically. Okay. And right away you start to see it changes the nature of your solution techniques when you do not have m equal to n because now you have to start formulating this as an optimization problem. So by the way, in deep neural nets, which we won't talk about so much in this class, but they're very strongly closely related to this. Oftentimes deep neural nets are more in the, uh, they tend to be structures like this, where what you wanna do, instead of this just being linear, it's now some nonlinear map from you know, so now you're looking at something like A of A and X and B. Okay, so you're going to try to say, how can I find some nonlinear functions to minimize subject to some constraints? And I can send some extra notes on that along for you guys to look at. But this idea here is going to be really important to start framing a broader viewpoint of what we're going to do in numerical linear algebra. We cannot constrain ourselves to be thinking about n by n's because most of the world is not an n by n. Okay. All right. Now notice a couple things. In this case here, I'm already starting to make use of norms, right? Lengths of vectors. This is going to be really critical for us. What does it mean to have a length of a vector? And this two norm is the one that we normally use. Pythagoras' theorem, you know, a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. This is the two norm. Here, I've already introduced a concept of a one norm. So what I'd like to do, spend a few moments talking about different kinds of norms, because they're going to play a big role in trying to solve problems like this, because I could have just as easily put a one norm right here. I could have just as easily dropped the two norm, just have a one norm. I could have a, a one half norm or a three norm. So lots of norms and choices of metrics and distances of measures. Okay, so let's talk about norms for a little bit. And I think the thing to think about with norms is a norm is just a way to measure distance. Okay, and for now, let's just consider a two dimensional space. X1 and X2. And then the question is, how do we normally measure distance in a two dimensional space? Well, if I have a point here, how do I measure the distance and length of that vector? What we normally do is think about, well, you go out a certain amount of x1, a certain amount of x2, and this is 
this distance here, right, the length of this thing, let's call it L, is equal to x1 squared, x2 squared, square root. So the two norm of a vector is equal to That's the two norm of that vector. So this is our Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem. And this is sort of how we normally measure distance from one space to another, OK? So oftentimes, this is also called the distance as the crow, as the crow flies. In other words, if you were in a city and you want to measure your distance from one spot to another, you could measure it in absolute distance like this, which is if, a, if you were, a, if you could fly above all the buildings, you could get there in that distance. But there are other norms that matter. For instance, what does the L1 norm look like? The L1 norm is often called the city block norm. The, the L1 norm sorry, is just the sum of this distance plus that distance. So if you were walking in the city, you'd walk one block this way, one block that way, or two blocks this way, one block this way. So this is a city block distance, if that makes sense. So if I was walking, this is actually the distance I'd have to walk. If I was flying, that would be the distance I would have to go. So these norms become really important because they are metrics and measures of distance and we will use them throughout this course for different purposes. And sometimes there is great advantage in using the L1 norm. Sometimes there's advantage in using the L2. Mostly what we typically do is use the L2. And in fact, a lot of the default linear algebra solvers in MATLAB by default are gonna just minimize something around the L2 norm. So when you solve AX equal to B when M is not equal to N, you just hit this. The default is going to be like, clearly, you want the smallest L2 norm of the vector. It may not be what you want, but that's what the default is going to be, because that's kind of what we normally think about. Uh, question uh, yes. so for L1, uh, is it the sum of uh, absolute values or? Sum of absolute values, sorry. Yes, I drew that wrong. Thank you. And then in general, there is an XP norm which is this thing to the pth and then the sum of each component to the pth power. Okay, so these are different norm metrics that we want to establish. So what we're gonna do in this first week is just start laying down some foundational things to be thinking about as we head off into the core material of the applied linear algebra. And so I want to start understanding all these structures, right? So first of all, we have square matrices. We have lots of decompositions, but really we have a lot of under and over determined systems to think of, and we have metrics to think of, okay? Uh, professor, I have yes. a question. Uh, what if the vector is complex? Uh, well, normally, if you would just absolute value everything. Sorry, I should have absolute value that there, then it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Here's what I want to talk about now, then, is I want to ask the following question. What are these norms? What does an L to the P ball look like? So what do I mean by that? When I think about an L2 norm, and that's the L2 norm here, what does we call this a ball of radius one in the L2 norm? See that? So I take this vector and its length is one in this two dimensional plane. Well, if you look at the definition here, it's x1 squared plus x2 squared, square root. So this is 
looking a lot like a radius. In fact, isn't this exactly what you would get if you had a circle? The equation of a circle, right, is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. That's exactly what this is. But now r squared is one. So in the L2 ball, the uh, L2 ball is actually a ball with radius one. Okay, so this is, I can put the square, I don't have to put the square because it's one, it doesn't matter. Everybody good with that? So I haven't told you anything you don't know. Question is, what does an L1 ball look like? What does an L1 ball look like? Well, now the definition of the L1 is just the sum of the, the absolute value of the sum of the two components has to equal one. So what you do is if you calculate that out, it's pretty easy to show that an L1 ball is a diamond. This is, because I just add the two components and they had to have to add, equal, add up to one. That's a really bad drawing, but that's all right. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is an L2 ball. This is an L1 ball. And if you do L less than one, It looks something like this. So for instance, this might be something like L equals one half. That's an L equals one half ball. And so there's L2, L1, L one half. You go all the way down to L zero. And what L zero looks like is the limit as this gets squished in is just a spike in each direction. That's the L0. On the other end, so L0, 1 half, 1, 2. And then the other norm that's often used is called the L infinity norm. And the L infinity norm is just simply the maximum value of any of these components. And so what it's going to look like, L infinity norm, it's a square. That's one, that's one. So it's a box with one on each side. Okay, so these are all different metrics we could use and norms and what the norms look like and what the, the, the unit ball looks like in different norms. Okay, it's really important that we understand not only are we working with now a more flexible framework and thinking about AX equal to B to include over under determined systems that we're going to have some flexibility about imposing some structure on it, right, some regularization to get a solution. But also, we can work with different norms if we wish. We can penalize different norms to get solutions. And these different norms have different properties. And we're going to start using these in places where appropriate. So it's very important that we're not just sticking with the L2 ball or L2 norms throughout this. One of the most important norms that has really come out in the last few years is super important is this L1 norm. And this is a this is a this one's fantastic and really a lot of interesting developments over the last decade on L1 norms. And where people are really working hard is to try to figure out, can you do the L0 norm? Because this L0 optimization tends to be NP hard, but people are really finding ways to actually make manageable L0 computations. Okay, but we'll get more into that as we go along. I have a question, sorry. So the L0 norm is not really a norm, right? It's a semi-norm. Exactly. So as you, as this thing goes to this limit, the L0 is special, right? It's not even a, it's a, it's a different kind of norm than the others. 
What does the L stand for in L12, et cetera, norm? Is it like Lagrangian or something like that? Oh, it's uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but it's not Lagrangian or any of those. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to look it up and see what it is. All right. Hello, Professor. This yes. is Anika. Uh, why is the L0 norm? Yes. Hello. Yep. Sorry, I think your internet's bad, Anika. Yeah, I think I got stuck. I was saying, like, why is the L0 norm empty hard to find? Uh, I don't want to get into that too much right now. It basically involves a combinatorial search to find solutions to this. And when you do a combinatorial search for large scale norms like this, so L2 norms, you can do through convex relax it. You know, it's, a, it's basically a convex optimization problem. Uh, L1 has recently been able, to been able to be formulated as a convex relaxation, but L0 so far has been combinatorial search. And that's a problem. That's where it becomes MP hard to find solutions. You have to look at every possible solution. And the minute you do every possible solution versus a gradient search, this is where it's problematic. Um, just another question. So don't we see like all norms are equivalent on Rn? So are we why so why do we need so many norms here? Or are we thinking about other metric spaces? Uh, the reason we're going to use it, we're going to use these different norms in different applications. So the two norm and one norm especially is what we're going to play around with in this class. The one norm often promotes sparsity and solutions. So for instance, I may want to solve this AX equal to B that is either massively or, uh, or uh, under or over determined. And I may want a solution with as many zeros and X as possible. There's many reasons why you might, might want that. I would then use the L1 norm as my regularizer. The L2 norm tries to make everybody super small. There's reasons why you want, might want to use that as well. But this L1 norm is really an important piece for metrics and really for penalization. Remember, this is just all about thinking about when I solve these systems, I need to impose a regularizer, right? Because it's an ill-posed math problem. And the minute I impose a regularization is the minute it's going to take on some structure of the solution. Okay, I'm going to keep moving on. Uh, race these. Now I want to start talking about uh, hitting a couple other key issues in solving AX equal to B. And in particular, I want to talk about what's called the Fredholm alternative. So the Fredholm alternative theorem is really important. And it's often one that's not really covered in a lot of linear algebra courses, maybe you hit it, I, I hit it more in grad school than undergrad, but it feels to me like something that should be in every undergraduate course in my view. So I think about AX equal to B. And I asked a very simple question, when can I solve it? Now, of course, you're gonna say, oh, just make sure the determinant of A is not zero, right? That's normally what you learn. But really, there's something deeper here that I want to hint at or highlight about Fredholm alternative, which is this operator A, it is a linear operator. It hits this vector X and it projects into the vector B, right? So that's all this thing is doing. But the operator A has a range, right? If you project any vector, it projects it into a range. One way to say about solvability is that B better be in that range or else you're not gonna be able to get a solution. Mathematically, the way we formulate this is in the following way. We consider AX equal to B and we're gonna consider 
a related problem, which is the adjoint problem, adjoint of A. And the adjoint of A, I'm going to denote A star. And A star is typically the transpose and complex conjugate of the matrix A. And what I'm going to consider is the following problem. A star A, A star Y equals to zero. So this is the adjoint operator of A and Y is essentially the null space. All the null space is, is the vectors, is the vector or set of vectors that basically projects you into zero to the null space. These are incredibly important. Another way to think about this is that these are the zero eigenvectors of A. Okay? And they're tremendously important because you'll see in a minute. So here's the question. When does AX equal to B have a solution? Well, what we could do is take this and dot both sides of this equation on the right with the vector y. In other words, the null space here. Ax dot y is equal b dot y. Now, it turns out the definition of the adjoint is actually that this thing here moves over to there. That is, by definition, what the adjoint does. Okay, so I'm looking for, a, so this A star is the vector that this is equivalent to this. Is equal to, so let me just make some note, this is by definition. We'll talk about computing that adjoint later. Right now, this is a definition of this. But what's A star Y? That's zero. So this x dotted against zero is zero. So what you end up getting is b dot y is equal to zero. Now the statement of Fred Holm alternative is the following. What it says is that for this to be solvable, the vector b, the right hand side, has to be orthogonal to the null space of the adjoint operator. Okay? That's a really important statement. It's a statement about solvability of AX equal to B. If B is not orthogonal to Y, you can't solve it. Okay? So this is a sort of a, a pretty fundamental result. Okay, there's one other piece that I want to add to this uh, around the concept of this null space and also about zero eigenvalues. So remember that one way to think about this is that this is equal to lambda y, where lambda is zero. So it's the zero eigenvalues. And zero eigenvalues have a very special role to play for us. Every zero eigenvalue corresponds to an invariance. And this is something Emmy Noether worked out. She was a fantastic mathematician and really was the first to highlight this, that every zero eigenvalue typically corresponds to some kind of invariant quantity. Let me just show you this in practice. So I have a x equal b. And let's suppose that I can find a null space for the operator a. Let's call this x naught. Suppose there is a vector, or it could be a collection of vectors. Right? It doesn't have to be one. I could, in fact, have a whole set of vectors that span the null space. And this is often called the kernel of the operator A, these things, these vectors that span the null space. All right, 
So let's talk about solutions to AX equal to B. Suppose I find a solution. Here's a solution to this. X is equal to, let's say the vector C. Suppose this is a solution. Okay, but if this has a null space, then I can simply make a new solution by adding some constant times that null space vector, right? Because if you put this in here, A hits this, that's just zero. So it still will satisfy this problem, but I have an arbitrary contribution I made here with any alpha. So in other words, I have a one parameter family. If there's a one vector in there, I have a one parameter family, an infinite number of solutions. This is an invariance that I have in my problem because I have a zero eigenvalue to the operator A. Okay, so this is very closely related to Fred Holm alternative as well about solvability. So here's the moral of the story. If you have a zero eigenvalue, that is tremendously meaningful. Okay, so if you find a zero eigenvalue, if you find a null space, those null spaces have a big role to play in your understanding of the kinds of solutions you're going to get in your problem. And they're also going to determine whether you have unique solutions or entire families of solutions, because I can always add any vector to the null space to my solution, and it's still a solution. Which again gets back to this uniqueness issue, and this is why we need to impose a regularization, which is, well, how am I going to determine this? Well, you might say like, okay, fine, give me the solution with the smallest L2 norm, and then, then it would pin this to a unique solution. So the regularization process is trying to get around the fact that in many of these problems, you have an infinite number of solutions. And for you to get a solution out is you must impose some kind of regularization to the system. Questions on that? So simple, right? I mean, in some ways, like I wrote it down, it was Fredholm alternative something is that you just have memorized, by the way. Um, again, it's always surprising to me we don't cover it in standard linear algebra course. Uh, you see it in graduate texts, but it's somehow very fundamental. When do you have a solution to AX equal to B? When the forcing B or the right-hand side B is orthogonal to the null space of the adjoint operator. You should memorize that statement for yourself. It's really important. Also, zero eigenvalues, eigenvectors, have a big role to play in our ability to solve these linear problems. All right, let's, uh, let's continue on. And what I wanted to do is, I think most of you will be familiar with most of these concepts, but I wanted to just make sure everybody's absolutely clear on properties of A, of AX equal to B when we think about A as being a linear operator. So A is a linear operator. So you take a vector and you multiply it by, if A hits the vector, so you're doing matrix a vector, matrix multiplying a vector, you get a new vector. And then one of the questions, this is a linear operation. And as a, the fact that it's linear allows you to say have a lot of nice properties. So for instance, you have, it's commutative, okay? So A plus B, Commutative, it's also associative.
This holds, by the way, for both vectors and matrices. And all of this is following directly out of the fact that these are linear operators. Okay? Some other things that we should know. You have distributive property, which is A, multiplying B plus C is the same as AB plus AC. So this is distributive. Okay? Associative. for the multiplication uh, but unlike addition you do not have co the commutative property holds in other words a times b does not equal b times a that's really important the order of the multiplication matters and it matters a great deal. So this does not hold, all these other properties hold out of these linear operators. And what we're gonna mostly be dealing with is thinking about the matrix A as a linear operator that acts on a vector to produce a new vector. And part of what we're gonna start thinking about is when this linear operation acts, we're gonna take that linear operation, which is a matrix and a lot of the focus, if you go back to the last lecture, is to say, how do I take that linear operator and do a matrix decomposition to break down its constitutive parts of what it's actually doing? What is the matrix A as a linear operation doing? And how can I exploit structure, in other words, write A as some kind of structured operation, like the SVD, QR, LU, any of these matrix decompositions we talk about, how do we write them down so as to take advantage of them as operators acting on vectors in nice ways. And so that's what we're gonna talk about throughout the set of the course, but I just wanted to make sure everybody was on board with these standard properties of linear operations. By the way, if the, linear, if the world was linear, we can solve everything. Fact. <laughs> It'd be a super boring world. They would have all solved it in like the 16 and 1700s and we'd have nothing to do. Uh, a little bit of nonlinearity does a lot for us. And so, but, so what we're gonna start, but linear algebra still plays a, a, the main role even in nonlinear problems. And so we need to know all the linear properties because we're gonna bring them into nonlinear problems, do data analytics, look at large scale data, look at subspaces where, where the data matters. So we're gonna be doing a lot of different things. Um, and, we're, and what we really care about is how can we guarantee these computations we're gonna be doing work, converge? Can we do them quickly? That's a lot of what the aspects of this numerical linear algebra are going for.